Okay, we are going to convene uh, this morning's joint committee hearing between the Senate Health Committee and uh, our gracious host, the Senate Consumer Protection Committee. Uh, so uh, welcome, I'm Senator Jared Kilvokalole, Chair of the Senate Health Committee. This Zoom meeting and YouTube live stream event uh, include the Tuesday, February 9th, 9 a.m. Joint Committee hearing between Health and Consumer Protection. Uh, the members of the committee are uh, myself, Vice Chair uh, Senator Baker, Senator Sharon Moriwaki, Senator Joy San Buenaventura, and Senator Kurt Favela. Uh, Chair Baker, would you like to introduce the members of your committee, please? Thank you. In uh, Conference Room 229, we have uh, Senator Clarence Ishihara. I have Senator uh, Bennett Michalucha, uh, Senator Gil Riviere, and on Zoom, uh, we have Senator Joy San Buenaventura and Senator Kurt Favela. Thank you very much. This meeting, including the audio and video of remote participants, is being streamed live on YouTube. You will find links to viewing options for all Senate meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislature's website. Uh, in the unlikely event that we must abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business on Thursday, February 9th at 10 a.m. Uh, I'm sorry, Thursday, February 11th at 10 a.m. and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. Uh, just a note for all testifiers, your audio and video will be muted and disabled until it is your turn to testify. Uh, there is a two minute limit uh, to testify per individual, so we ask that you please respect that. Uh, all the members have been, um, uh, all the testimony submitted today has been distributed to the m members and we've reviewed it. So if you'd like to stand on your testimony or add any additional comments, please feel free to do so within the two minutes time limit. Uh, if there are any technical glitches during your turn to testify, please be patient. We may move to the next person and try and see if we can circle back to you. Uh, I will be reading a list of the individuals who have submitted uh, written testimony, and we apologize if the closed captioning doesn't accurately transcribe the names. Uh, if you are interested in reviewing the written testimony, please go to the legislature's website at www.capital.hawaii.gov and look for the link to testimony on the status page of each measure. And uh, as is customary, we will be asking uh, all of the testifiers on, a, uh, on each measure uh, to present, and then we'll have members uh, open for questions. The first measure on today's agenda is SB 131 relating to psychologists. This requires the Board of Psychology to establish a pilot program to grant prescriptive authority to qualified psychologist applicants in counties with a population of less than 100,000 persons. Uh, first up, we have uh, the DCCA Board of Psychology, Christopher Fernandez, offering comments. Good morning, uh, committee chairs and committee members. Uh, at this time, the board wishes to stand on its testimony. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, offering comments from the University of Hawaii, Carolyn Ma. Good morning, chairs, coach of the committee. University of Hawaii stands on our testimony offering comments and will be available for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, testifying in opposition for the Hawaii Medical Association, Elizabeth Van Dignacio. Aloha. Uh Committee, the Hawaii Medical Association stands on our testimony and is available for questions. Thank you. Testifying for the Hawaii Psychiatric Medical Association uh, in opposition, Nahilani Webster. Hi, good morning, chairs and members of the committee. Nahilani Webster testifying on behalf of Hawaii Psychiatric Medical Association in opposition to SB 131. Um, while we appreciate and support increased access to mental health treatment, we believe there are alternative ways in which to achieve this goal. Authorizing prescriptive authority to psycho psychologists without the extensive medical training places patients at unnecessary risk. There are many drug-to-drug -drug interactions critically impacting how a person responds to certain medications, and this requires medical school training only. 
Creating a new form of training to bypass current existing medical programs is unnecessary as we have current medical and nursing schools available. An alternative approach to improve access to healthcare in our rural communities is through telehealth and collaborative care. These proven and already implemented methods should be expanded and supported. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony and available if you have questions. Thank you, and uh, thank you also to Elizabeth for activating uh, your video to testify. Up next, we have Bradley Cool, the Hawaii Association of Professional Nurses and Opticians. Nope, okay. We also have uh, Stephen Kemble in opposition. Uh, H. Blaisdell Brennan. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Judy Stein in opposition. I mean, uh, in support. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Um, ma mahalo. I appreciate the time to be here. I would uh, like to testify as an individual as well as the representative of the Hawaii Psychological Association. And in addition, I would, I'm hoping to be able to bring Dr. Tom Brady on is a psychiatrist who teaches um, students in the Masters of Science in Clinical Psychopharmacology program for Alliant International University. He hasn't been able to get the password yet. Um, so I would like to address um, the issue regarding nurses first in terms of training. The Hawaii program, which is no longer open, uh, was the first and our legislation that we've submitted here today um, we were the first state in the country to include nurses as trainees because although they do not have medical training, we do respect the training that nurses have received. When nurses receive training sufficient to become prescribing, uh, prescribing nurses, they do not go to medical school, they go to nursing school, and they um, are provided with the appropriate clinical experience in order to be able to be very efficient in addressing the community and, and their needs for mental health care. I would like to point out that prescribing psychologists or medical psychologists have been um, active for over 20 years. They provide service in the military, they provide service in the Indian Health Service, and they provide service all around the world for um, in the human and health services on the federal level. And so um, I believe that the experience of the training that we offer, which includes um, didactic learning from pharmacists, prescribing psychologists, physicians, um, nurses, and psychiatrists um, is more than sufficient in terms of the number of hours that we've proposed in this bill. We have at least 300 more hours of clinical training than a nurse practitioner has. And so I am available for additional comments. The Hawaii Psychological Association is in strong support of this training or the, the, the pilot program that is proposed for Kauai. And I would just like to say that we have had 37 years of trying to bring this legislation forward and we have not answered the initial question and problem from 37 years ago, which is to have more mental health providers who can prescribe for the state of Hawaii. And Kauai, undergoing what they are experiencing with the pandemic, really needs us to launch this effort to test to see how it works in Hawaii. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so that's all the testimony we've received from individuals who indicated that they will be present for the meeting. Uh, is there anyone else present in the meeting who would like to testify on this measure? Okay, seeing none, what I'm gonna do is read off for the record the names of the individuals who testified in support and then I'll do opposition and then we can take questions. So uh, offering testimony and support, but indicating that they will not be present, we have Derek Kawakami, Kauai Mayor. We have Dr. Derek Phillips of the American Society for the Advancement of Pharmacotherapy. Uh, Dr. Joseph Komati, 
in support. Uh, Dr. Andrew Feng, uh, Peter Smith, Dr. Marcus Van Sickle, offering late testimony in support. We have Dr. Troy James, a uh, clinical and consulting services of Atlanta, uh, Judith White, Thomas Brady, Tanya Gamby, Jason uh, Samuel Sutton, and Jill Gray. Jill Gray, offering testimony in opposition with Dr. Linda Onigawa, of the American Psychiatric Association, Aaron Phillips, uh, Michael Rao, Roland Ng, Sophia Jimenez, Andrew Rouge, Sharon Tizwa, Jason Warchel, uh, Catherine Egan, Maurice Springer, Charles Parente, Sherry Armstrong, Rose Stevens, Christopher Jordan, Christina Lee, Sylvia Ku, Carlton Ewan, Scott Filipino, Elaine Habe, Wynette Kitajima, Elaine Francisco, Julian Alwes, Naomi Bickle, Ashley Mathy, Kiyonari Noguchi, Morgan Kalger, Rika Suzuki, Ani Tokat, Iqbal Ahmed, Rodel Mallet, Jeffrey Chester, Patrick Pumple, Selma Koo, Jeffrey Akaka, Dennis V. Lee, Tana Boyer, H. Blaisdell Brennan, Lauren Ng, Nash Witten, Christian Ogasawara, Ailea Apana, Tanya Hopkins, and uh, Jason. That's all the testimony we've received. Members, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move to the next measure on the agenda, which is SB 63. Relating to electronic smoking devices, this makes unlawful the sale of flavored products for electronic smoking devices, mislabeling of e-liquid products containing nicotine, and sale of tobacco products other than through retail sales via in-person exchange. Uh, it also clarifies definitions related to tobacco, to tobacco products and requires retailers to pay an additional excise tax on the retail price of electronic smoking devices. First, we have the Department of Health. Good morning, Chair, Senator Kalole, and um, Senator Baker. Thank you so much for the opportunity to provide testimony. I'm Lola Irvin, representing Dr. Libby Char from the Department of Health. And the department strongly supports SB 63. It is a very comprehensive measure that addresses the policy changes that the department has been requesting for several years to protect our youth from um, the e-cigarette marketing. And so um, in terms of 2019 data, we do, um, we have been sharing with you that um, our youth smoking rate, e-cigarette use rates have increased from 25.5% to 30.6%. Sadly also, um, it is worse on the neighbor islands and so, um, while we say one in three youth are reporting currently using e-cigarettes, it is higher in Hawaii County, 35.4%, Hawaii, 35.9%, and on Maui, 36.4%. And so uh, we are very concerned and we do appreciate um, that SB 63 would address the major policy issues that we have been requesting to protect our youth. I'm available for questions, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you, Lola. Next, we have the Department of Taxation offering comments. Good morning, Chairs. Jacob Hurlitz on behalf of the Department of Taxation will stand on our written comments, pointing out a possible uh, inadvertent double taxation issue and also requesting a January 1st, 2022 effective date for the tax provisions. I'm available for questions, thank you. Thank you. Uh, testifying in support, the Hawaii Public Health Institute, Jessica Yamauchi. 
Thank you, chairs, vice chairs, and members of the committee. Jessica Yamauchi with the Hawaii Public Health Institute, which houses the Coalition for Tobacco Free Hawaii. We are in strong support of this measure, which offers comprehensive regulations on e cigarettes. Uh, you have our written testimony, but I did want to highlight just a couple of things. Um, much of our testimony echoes the Department of Health, and we offer the same amendment provided by the Department of Taxation. To advance equity, we must address the root causes of tobacco use. For decades, the tobacco industry has profited from targeting youth of color and other low-income populations. African Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Filipinos are disproportionately affected by the harms caused by tobacco. Comprehensive regulations on the predatory industry will address the root causes of tobacco use. Ending the sale of flavors in tobacco products reduces the appeal. Including the flavor menthol is especially important as its cooling properties have been exploited by the tobacco industry to mask the harshness of tobacco smoke and was heavily marketed to youth and vulnerable groups such as the African American community. In Hawaii, 78% of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders who smoke use menthol cigarettes and as a result, they suffer from a greater burden of tobacco-related disease. Taxation and restrictions on online sales will help to decrease the accessibility of these products. Funding prevention education programs and cessation services most benefits populations that experience higher rates of tobacco use. Hawaii has made enormous progress on tobacco control, and we ask the legislature to take the necessary steps to reverse our youth vaping epidemic in order to protect our youth from a lifetime of addiction. We thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony and strong support of this measure. Thank you. Next, we have the Hawaii Food Industry Association offering comments. Okay, testifying for Aloha Care, Trish Lachika. Good morning, Chairs. Good morning, Vice Chairs and members of the committees. I'm Trish Lachika, testifying on behalf of Aloha Care in strong support. Uh, Aloha Care is the only health plan dedicated to exclusively serving the Medicaid population who um, are, in fact, um, disproportion disproportionately impacted by use of um, tobacco and electronic smoking devices. Uh, we uh, appreciate the legislature's action to um, introduce and move forward with this measure that would be a comprehensive approach on the regulation of e-cigarettes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, testifying in opposition, the American Vaping Association, Gregory Conley. Good morning. Thank you for having me, members of the committee. My name is Gregory Conley, and I currently serve as the president of a national nonprofit called the American Vaping Association. And we advocate nationwide for policies that recognize the wide difference between combustible cigarettes and smoke-free, tobacco-free, often nicotine-free products like vaping products. Considering that there are still 150,000 adult smokers remaining in the state of, of, uh, of Hawaii, we want to strongly urge you to reject Senate Bill 63 Equity will not be achieved by taxing and banning products that kill in the same way as those that are potentially going to be marked by the FDA as appropriate for the protection of public health. Very briefly, I'd just like to let the, com the, the committee know about what is happening at the federal level. Not only do we just have Congress pass an expansive law on online sales of vaping products that goes into effect at the end of month that requires all uh, retailers to register, use specific shipping services that check ID at delivery, uh, remit, collect and remit any excise taxes with real federal penalties behind it. So at the same time that Congress is instituting this wide reaching law that's bringing about major change, we're just moving to, well, just ban it all, ban the shipping entirely. Don't think that is appropriate. The FDA is currently uh, putting these products, each individual manufacturer is putting these products through what's known as a pre-market tobacco review application process. And the standard in that process is, is the product appropriate for the protection of public health, not just the health of the user, but the health of the population as a whole, including youth. So in the next year, Joe Biden's FDA could declare that a coffee flavored vaping product is appropriate for the protection of public health, yet it will still be banned in the state of Hawaii. I don't think that makes sense, nor does the high tax when we have data from other states, as seen in, um, you can see in my written testimony, and as reported in the Wall Street Journal just uh, two, three weeks ago, cigarette smoking has gone up during the pandemic. So we need, we can't just treat 
uh, one-size-fits-all approach will leave people behind. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Next, we have in opposition uh, the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, Lindsay Stroud. And I know Lindsay cannot make it. Okay. Uh, in opposition, Americans for Tax Reform, Tim Andrew. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Americans for Tax Reform. I thank, the I thank the members of the committee for their valid concern about how to reduce smoking rates. However, in order to do this, we need to enact policy that's based on evidence and based on science, as opposed to emotion and anecdotes. And what the science overwhelmingly shows, what has been promoted by over 30 of the world's leading medical bodies, what has been stated by the FDA is that e-cigarettes play a critical role in tobacco harm reduction and in saving lives. In fact, according to Georgetown University Medical Center, a meta-analysis they did with some of the US's top cancer scientists, it has the potential to save 6.6 .6 million lives across the United States over the next 10 years. The reason for this is that the cancer-causing effects of combustible tobacco isn't nicotine, Rather, it's the process of burning tobacco leaf and the smoke which produces hundreds of chemicals. Water vapour, which is what e-cigarettes are based on, you eliminate virtually all of these. This is why meta-analysis conducted by groups like Public Health England, where they reviewed hundreds of peer-reviewed academic studies, have shown that these are 95% safer than combustible tobacco. Similarly, they have the same principle as things like nicotine gums, nicotine patches, which also deliver nicotine. But due to the nature of the psychological and ritual nature of these products, they're twice as effective as other approved nicotine replacement products. So if we want to restrict access to these, the data proves that more people will end up smoking. The data also proves two things. One. For adults who want to quit smoking, flavours are critical in their decision to help them quit. Two, they don't actually matter for youth. Survey after survey have found that flavours don't really matter for youth uptake of vaping Mr. products. Mr Andrews, please wrap up your remarks. And San Francisco, it failed where they banned it again. Please look after the issue, which is youth uptake through appropriate enforcement mechanisms, but don't stop adults from quitting smoking. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, in support the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, Hawaii Pacific, Cynthia Al. Thank you, Chairs and Vice Chairs and Joint Committee members. Cynthia Al testifying on behalf of the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. We support this measure, measure and we stand on our submitted testimony. We want to emphasize that the definition of tobacco products should be broadened to capture new and emerging products, including electronic smoking devices. The definition is limited to products made of tobacco. Thank you. Next in support, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids Hawaii, Liza Ryan Gill. Aloha Chairs, Vice Chairs and members of the committee, Liza Ryan Gill uh, with Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids here in Hawaii. And I just wanted to make a, a couple of points that are uh, salient to some of the testimony that we heard before and to stand with the Department of Health and HiFi and uh, it, um, American Cancer Society is that more than 80% of our youth who use e-cigarettes, which is we've already heard is more than 30% in our islands, use flavors. And flavors like Lolo Lime, Halava Strawberry, Pineapple Ice, ones that are made specifically to attract kids of their age. Also, it is critical that we don't back burner this issue, even uh, d despite the pandemic that we are in, because a recent study by the Stanford Medical School showed that kids that vape are five times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19 than their counterparts that don't. So this is not just an issue about, uh, about their future health uh, and their lung health and being safe from addiction. 
it is also a question of whether or not we are making them more vulnerable to contracting the virus currently. And I will also say that recent studies during the pandemic by the Truth Initiative have shown that our, that our Kiki are actually asking and wanting help to quit, um, but are afraid to come forward. So any initiatives that, that penalize them instead of keeping the door open so that they can come to their teachers and their, and their parents, Will, um, will not allow them to seek the treatment that they, that they so desire. And lastly, I would just say, we support um, completely a comprehensive approach to combating the youth vaping crisis, uh, including taxation, regulation, and removing flavors. Just as uh, the old big tobacco companies were not, um, uh, were not brought down and smoking uh, decreased through one particular action, it takes multiple different points of, a, of um, policy Jill, to, to change. Can you please conclude your remark? Yeah, thank you, that's it. Well, you didn't have to <laughs> so abruptly, but thank you. Uh, okay, oh. next in opposition, we have Kay Nguyen. Okay, also in opposition, Anthony Orozco. Okay, uh, that's all the testimony submitted on this measure where the individuals indicated that they would be present. Are there any other individuals on the call who would like to testify on this measure SB 63? Okay, seeing none, uh, I'm gonna go through and again read the names of the testifiers who submitted written testimony. We have the Attorney General's Office offering comments, uh, also offering supportive testimony. We have the Hawaii State Teachers Association, uh, Hawaii Keiki, the Hawaii COPD Coalition, the Hawaii Dental Association, the American Lung Association, Hawaii. Uh, we are One Incorporated, uh, offering comments to the Hawaii Primary Care Association in support of the Hawaii Substance Abuse Coalition, uh, Jamil Folio for the Man Cave in support. Uh, also in support, we have friends of Kamalani and Lidgate Park. Uh, Hawaii Children's Action Network Speaks, uh, Dr. Andrew Rouge, Teresa Ng, Forrest Fett, Carolyn Eaton, Richard Collins, James Raymond, Dana Kiabe, Brian Myth, Marilyn Gagan, Patricia Blair, Kenichi Yabusaki, Elizabeth Hore, David Kingdon, Colleen Inoue, Olivia Uchima, Linda Weiner, Holly Kabuma, Grace Kim, Colby Takeda, Mary Santa Maria, Eric Chen, Scott Stendrud, Lauren Simpson Gomez, Erica Yamauchi, Rochelle Bohal, Roxanne Rowe, Kathleen Koga, Helen Barrow, offering late testimony and support with uh, Kaiser Permanente, Waianae Coast Comprehensive Center. Uh, Valerie Crab, Nadine Wu, Raylan Yeoman, Angela Savage, and Corey Chun. Testifying in opposition. Michael Ziner, Scott Rasek, Nicholas Winters, Jeff Stevens, Monica Lopez, Vin Kim, Jessica Chang, Alex Abe, Susan Larson, Rafael Montero. Uh, Vapor Bar Inc., Justin Iriarte, Vin Tran, Jenna Kim, Lonnie Hernandez, and Chris Anton. Did I miss anyone? Okay, members questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. We're gonna to move to the last item on this joint agenda, SB 1147, relating to tobacco products. This establishes the offense of unlawful shipment of tobacco products and includes e-liquid and electronic smoking devices within the de definition of tobacco products as used in the cigarette tax law. Uh, Attorney General's office, support. Okay, Department of Health. Thank you, Senators. Thank you. Yep. 
is the Attorney oh, that, General's so office. Lola, why don't you go ahead and then we'll go back to the Attorney General. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Senator Jacob Holmes, Kalola, and um, Senator Baker. I'm Lola Irvin, representing Director Libby Char for the Department of Health. So um, we are very um, grateful that you are hearing SB 1147, which um, was a bill requested by the administration, and it would um, address the youth uh, vaping epidemic. And so one thing to remember is that the pandemic um, happened, um, and we were still in the lung injury um, outbreak. And prior to that, the Surgeon General had declared a national epidemic of youth vaping. And so um, we're very concerned because we were still addressing those issues and then the pandemic hit. And we know that these products are not benign, that um, e-cigarettes and e-liquids are based on nicotine, flavored nicotine products, often with um, vegetable oil and alcohol, as the solvent to heat the nicotine and then flavored um, to attract the youth. So, as our youth have not been in schools too, we're concerned about the impact of nicotine on the developing brain, knowing that um, it does um, impact their learning, their memory retention, mood disorders, and primes their developing brains for addiction. Of course, we're also concerned about the COVID-19 risks, knowing that the youth have reported that they enjoy sharing the um, e-cigarettes, and so as youth return to school, uh, we really do need um, some protective policies in place. There are 31 states and territories that have put in place regulations, um, including the um, retail licensing of um, distributors and wholesalers, and we do not have such protections in Hawaii. So we thank you so much, knowing that youth are sensitive to pricing, and that's what this bill would do. It would also prohibit the online sales and delivery of these products to our youth in Hawaii. So we thank you so much for the opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you, Lola. Attorney General's office. Good morning, Deputy Attorney General Delaney Prescott-Tate. The department supports this bill and the repeal of the electronic smoking device retailer registration unit based on the move to regulate electronic smoking devices and e-liquids through the Department of Taxation. The relevant points are contained in my written testimony and I will remain available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next in support, Department of Taxation. Uh, good morning, Chairs. Jacob Hurlitz on behalf of Department of Taxation. Uh, I will stand on our written testimony and support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, offering comments, Tax Foundation, Mr. Yamachika. Okay, also offering comments, the Hawaii Food Industry Association. Okay, in opposition, the American Vaping Association, Mr. Conley. Chair and members of the committee, I will not repeat anything in my prior testimony. We urge you to oppose SB 1147. As we previously noted, uh, Congress just passed very strict federal regulation of online sales that is changing the industry in a huge way. Uh, Hawaii, because of its special status, Hawaii and Alaska will be able to continue to receive shipping through USPS, unlike the rest of the country, but sales will still need to occur and it will be a violation of federal law to not sell the product where at ID or rather at delivery, the shipper or the postman is not checking ID. Uh, and lastly, just in response to some comments made during the public comment, uh, a volley, the lung injuries that were caused by vaping products, those were found to be caused by illicit contaminated THC products. So if you wonder why a volley became such a problem, part of it is that even while the FDA and CDC were saying that the evidence is pointing to illicit THC products, opportunists were still going out and trying to pretend that these lung injuries were being caused by nicotine vaping products, leaving people the false impression that, oh, these THC vaping products, they're okay. Um, so again, we're glad to answer any questions, but we urge opposition to SB 1147. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, supporting testimony from Aloha Chair, Trish Lachika. Aloha, good morning, Chairs, Vice Chairs, and Committee Members. Trish Lachika on behalf of Aloha Care. 
Uh, we stand in support of this bill. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, this would help to um, regulate e-cigarettes e e e through taxation, permitting, and licensing. Um, and close the online sales loopholes. Um, just like to note that um, regardless of the online sales passed by Congress, it only applies to USPS. It does not apply to curbside delivery or to other um, third party um, shipping and delivery sales. Um, in fact, during the pandemic here in Hawaii, many of our vape shops refused to adhere in, um, to the emergency orders and chose to remain open despite not being an essential service. Um, just showing the lack of um, respect for um, our public health laws and protection. And I believe we believe that this is a measure that would help to um, regulate an industry that has long gone without um, public health protections for so long. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Hawaii Public Health Institute, Yamaguchi, in support. Thank you, Chairs. Um, I'll, I'll stand on our written testimony and strong support, uh, reiterating most of what we said in the uh, previous bill. The, but these are regulations we have been working on for over five years now, um, and we do hope that the, the legislature can move this forward this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, American Cancer Society, Cynthia Al. Cynthia, your volume is a little low. Thank you for allowing me to testify. We support this measure and stand on our submitted testimony. And we want to again emphasize that the definition of tobacco products should be broadened to capture new and emerging products, including electronic smoking devices. Further, we do not recommend that e-liquid should be defined separately and included in the definition of electronic smoking device. We again support tax parity for all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, and applauds the bill for taxing e-cigarettes at 70% of their wholesale price in line with many of the other tobacco products in Hawaii. Right now in Hawaii, e-cigarettes are not taxed at parity, making them an appealing alternative for price-sensitive consumers, especially including the youth. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of this matter. Thank you very much. That's all the testimony we've received from individuals who indicated they would be present. Is there anyone on the call who would like to testify on this measure? Okay, I'd also like to note the written testimony in support from the Hawaii COPD Coalition, the American Lung Association Hawaii, the Hawaii Substance Abuse Coalition, uh, Blue Zones, the Blue Zones Project, Comments from the Hawaii Primary Care Association, support from friends of Kamalani and Lidgate Park, the Hawaii Apathy Center for Law and Economic Justice, the Hawaii State Teachers Association, uh, and also opposition testimony from uh, Volcano Vape Shop, Americans for Tax Reform, uh, the Taxpayer Protection Alliance, the Hawaii Smokers Alliance, and and uh, I'd also like to note because they're they're basically the same individuals who testified on the prior measure. There are 19 individuals, uh, private individuals, who submitted testimony in support of this measure, and there are 26 individuals, mem uh, members of the public, who submitted. Uh, testimony in opposition to this measure. Members, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. We are going to recess for decision making. Recess. Okay, we're going to reconvene for decision making on this 9 a.m. joint agenda. Uh, first measure, SB 131, regarding, to, uh, regarding a, a pilot project for a prescriptive authority for psychologists on Kauai. 
I'm going to recommend that we defer this measure. I'm going to note, um, I'm going to take a second here to note the displeasure that I have with the uh, DCCA on this. You know, um, proposing a, a four-year rollout of a pilot project for the island of Kauai um, really is not what I think the advocates uh, and the members in the community who do not have access to this type of care we're really looking for. But given the, um, so I acknowledge the concerns of the members of the committees that something needs to be done on this issue. Given the shortened uh, schedule and the number of issues that we need to take up in this committee, I'm gonna recommend that we defer the measure. Any discussion? Um, Chair, uh, I respect your decision. I am disappointed that uh, this pilot program on this island, which has very limited, I, I believe less than a handful of psychiatrists on the island is, um, is that this measure is being deferred. But like I said, I respect your decision. Thank you. The next measure, SB 63, uh, the Attorney General's office noted that there is a title problem with this bill. So we are going to incorporate the flavor prohibition provisions of this measure into the next bill. Uh, so we're going to defer this, this measure, SB 63. Uh, we'll move to the last measure, SB 1147. Uh, so we're going to add sections 2 and 3 from Senate Bill 63 to this measure. Uh, we're going to exempt menthol from the prohibition, which I know is a controversial um, uh, provision in the bill, uh, but I would like to move this measure out, and I would like to have a vehicle that uh, is best positioned for success as we negotiate, hopefully, and, and move this measure on. Uh, we're going to accept the Attorney General amendments related to Section 2 and 3 of SB uh, 63. Those are related to the prima facie evidence standard, due process, and clarity on where the money will go. Uh, in Section 4 and 5 of this bill, we're going to blank out the uh, fee amount. I'm going to recommend we delete Section 6 because it's not relevant. Uh, there are no changes being proposed. Uh, and defect the effective date, and note in the committee report that the Department of Taxation asked that if the bill does pass, that the effective date be, late, be delayed until the end of the next calendar year. There are also technical amendments. Uh, any discussion? Senator San Buena Ventura. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. My understanding also is that you are going to exempt menthol from the flavor ban uh, because, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, uh, Vice Chair passing with amendments. Chair votes aye. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair is torn, but we'll support the Chair voting aye. I don't like the fact that we're taking out menthol. Uh, Senator Moriwaki? Aye. Senator San Buenaventura? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Uh, thank you very much. Are we going to vote to? Uh, for CPN, same recommendation, passed with amendments. Chair votes aye. I don't have the vote sheet. Oh, this is it. Oh, okay. Senate Bill 1147. Okay, got it. Okay. Yes, with amendment. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Chang, I mean Chang. Aye. Senator Ms. Ocha. Aye. Ms. Cheryl goes aye. Senator Revere. Aye. Senator Sam Brentora. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Motion's adopted. Thank you, members. Uh, thank you very much. We're adjourned. Good morning, everyone. We'll call the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection to order. 
uh, after a, a very interesting uh, hearing with, uh, jointly with the Committee on Health. This morning we have, uh, at the beginning of our agenda, Senate Bill 946, relating to commercial property rent relief. Um, this would establish a commercial rent relief grant program requires that the commercial rent relief grants be given priority for monies received through federal funding. Uh, this measure goes on to Ways and Means uh, if it is adopted by this committee. We have testimony and support from uh, Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii, uh, Joe's Grill Express, Hawaii U.S. Federal Credit Union, uh, BOMA Hawaii, HUB Hawaii, Okinawan Chamber of Commerce. Uh, all of these are in support. Hawaii Farm Bureau, Hawaii Association of Realtors, uh, MW Group, LTD, Real Estate Development, Global Village Kailua, Retail Merchants of Hawaii, Eggs and Things Hawaii, ABC Stores, and I believe we have a testifier on Zoom at the end of our agenda, our end of our testifier list, Ryan Tanaka, Island Business Management, LLC. Ryan, are you there? Yes, hi, good morning. Welcome. Please proceed with your testimony. Sure, uh, my name is Ryan Tanaka of Island Business Management. I'm testifying in strong support of Senate Bill 946 relating to commercial rent relief. Thank you, Senator Chang, for introducing the bill and to Chair Baker and the CPM Committee for hearing SB 946. To be sensitive to everyone's time since your last hearing went a little over, I'll stand behind my written testimony and strong support. Thank you again, and I hope this committee and all of its members will join us in supporting Senate Bill 946. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I've been handed some late testimony uh, from Fun Factory in support, uh, from Jungle Fun Island in support, the Maui Chamber of Commerce in support, uh, Blair Suzuki, Suzuki Properties LLC in support, Hawaii Tourism, um, Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association, uh, Mupi Hanneman in support, HFIA, Hawaii Food Industry Association in support, uh, Mark Hagedorn in support, and we have Ale Steak LLC in support. Members, uh, we have one um, person on our Zoom who can answer questions, if there are any questions. I have a question, yes, Chair. Senator Mitchell Lucha. Mr. Tanaka, my understanding is that this uh, measure is actually being uh, pushed forth by a coalition of, of businesses, which I commend you for taking that role. Um, my, I wanted to just check in with you whether there's mechanisms by which you can make sure that the small mom and pops are not left out of the discussion, particularly those that are, especially in my district, there's uh, a lot of folks who may not speak English as a uh, first language. So are there any mechanisms by which you can do outreach for these uh, mom and pops? Thank you, Senator Muslucha, for your question. And um, you know, we did talk about this, you and I, the other day. Um, I'll, I'll just share that in the as COVID-19 has, has pulverized so many businesses and there's been various programs out there, I was personally involved in one of the very first CARES um, outreach programs. There's a grant program to help small businesses. I worked closely with DBED as an extra translator and providing additional translators for Japanese speaking business owners. I understand that they also were able to get translators for other, other languages, um, Chinese, Lacano, uh, Korean, you know, and so forth, um, uh, Spanish. And so in, in that particular case, it was a small business owner who applied. And they were the only ones who really were um, between them and, and the administering body. In the case of this particular program, you would have um, the, la the small business would apply, but the monies would go to the landlords to ensure that the money is used for its intended purpose. The bank, the financial institutions are also heavily behind this measure, and the credit unions have, have offered and committed to administering should the need arise. So, <coughs> excuse me. So I think one, one major difference, Senator Matilucha, is that you're gonna have between the landlords and banks, they will be assisting, uh, they're, they're eligible 
small business tenants in providing translation services. And I don't think the need will be the same where the DBED had to step in and get involved. Uh, we can also discuss, should that need arise, you know, re um, mobilizing that platform of translators. But if not, then, you know, I, I, from the landlords that we've talked with and the fence that we've spoken with, they, they are gearing up to personally help their small business tenants who are eligible with any, any language barriers. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Tanaka. Sure. Members, any other questions for our testifiers that have joined us? If not, thank you very much for uh, providing testimony and answering our questions. The next item on our agenda is, why does it want to come up? Senate Bill um, 903 relating to affordable housing. Uh, this measure would limit monthly rent increases for certain dwelling units to an unspecified percent for the term of the rental agreement or every 12 months, whichever is longer. Prohibits rent increases due to the landlord's negative cash flow resulting from refinancing or purchasing the rental dwelling unit. Establishes a rent stabilization advisory working group to advise on matters relating to the stabilization of certain dwelling units rental amounts requires the LRB to conduct a study on actions that other states have taken to incentivize landlords to stabilize rent. This measure, uh, should it pass out of uh, CPN, goes on to a joint committee between WAM and JDC. Uh, our first testifier is the director of DCCA, Catherine Alpuni Colon. Kat, are you on? Uh, good morning, Chair Baker, uh, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, unfortunately, Director Colon was not able to attend, so uh, Joanne Uchida Takeuchi, I'm here in her stead. Uh, the department stands on its written testimony uh, with regard to this bill. I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Okay, and as I understand it, the department is not in favor of this measure. Correct. Thank you. Uh, we have Mr. David Chi uh, as an attorney, but testifying as an individual. Mr. Chi, are you on the Zoom? Oh, yes, I am. Would you please uh, share your testimony with the committee? Sure. Um, I, I believe I uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you. Um, as you are aware, I've provided written testimony. Um, I'm really concerned that this bill seems to be um, designed, you know, I, I, I like the idea of promoting long-term uh, stable rental relationships between landlords and tenants. Um, my concern is that this bill will, will not actually uh, accomplish that. I think that it will actually, um, if we actually implement this bill, that you're more likely to end up with short-term relationships and more disruption in, in the, in the um, more disruption, more turnover of, of tenants. Um, I do think that the idea of studying um, this, uh, studying this, um, how to get to that point um, makes more sense than it is to just implementing this bill. So I would suggest that um, perhaps you implement, you know, the studies and to see how we can achieve long-term stable relationships. Um, but I don't think that this bill is actually going to accomplish anything um, to, towards that end. Um, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We have testimony from LRB offering comments. Charlotte Carter Yamauchi, or anybody representing LRB on the <coughs> this morning. Um, they didn't take a position, but um, they, if LRB is going to be, if we move it out, and LRB is going to. Uh, be involved, they want their scope of the study clarified. Our last testifier on Senate Bill 903 is the Hawaii Association of Realtors. In opposition, do we have some on the call this morning from HAR? If not, members, I will just note for the record their opposition. Um, and we also, I think we I think we uh, included David Chi's uh, testimony in here twice, so we appreciate him taking time to, um, to share his thoughts with us. Uh, members, are there any questions for DCCA or anyone on the call? If not, shall we move forward to mm -hmm. Senate Bill 205? 
Uh, this measure is relating to deferred deposits. Reduces the maximum fee a check casher may charge under a payday loan agreement for deferring the deposit of a check from 15% to 7% of the face value of the check. Uh, DFI. Iris Ikeda. Are you on the Zoom? Yes, I see you thank there. You. <laughs> Please proceed. We will stand on our testimony and I am available to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, all right. I think, let's see. Do we have, we'll go, members, any questions for Iris or any yeah. of the other testifiers? I believe we have uh, the next item on our agenda is Senate Bill 973. Uh, this measure is relating to Hawaii Money Transmitters Act, amends the Money Transmitter Act, changes the short title to Monetary Transmitters Modernization Act, incorporates definition of key terms uh, provided in the draft model money service business law published by the Conference of State Bank Supervisors add supporting documentation to be submitted by a license applicant, extends the period of a license applicant's litigation and criminal conviction history review from five to 10 years. Um, next date of the application requires a license applicant to submit information regarding any bankruptcy or receivership, uh, clarifies the authority of the commissioner of financial institutions relating to examinations and investigations of licensees to participate in nationwide protocols of licensing cooperation. Iris. Aloha, Chair Baker and members of the committee. So thank you for hearing this bill. We are um, supporting this bill to allow DFI to um, license, regulate, and supervise on a national basis um, with the other states who are participating in the model law. I am available for questions. Okay, members, any questions for Iris? If not, let's go to the last uh, item on our agenda this morning. I, uh, my clicker doesn't want to move it around, but oh well. Fortunately, I have a printed company. When electronics fail you, print is always a good backup. Uh, this, the last item on our agenda is Senate Bill 974 relating to consumer protection. Provides a new uh, viable install, installment based small dollar loan transaction in addition to enhanced deferred deposit transactions. Specifies various consumer protections required for small dollar loans. Beginning in 1 1 2023, requires licensure for small dollar lenders that offer small dollar loans to consumers subject to the oversight of the Division of Financial Institutions of the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs to protect against illegal lending. Specifies licensing requirements for small dollar lenders, caps interest at 36% per annum, and one simple maximum monthly maintenance fee tiered up to $50. Amortizes loans in full and reviewing the loan while also permitting borrowers to choose to repay the loan without penalty. Caps maximum allowable costs at 60% of the loan principal loan amount, preventing a loan from being either too short or too long in dur duration. Caps the maximum allowable loan size at $1,500, providing more flexibility for lenders and bar borrowers than under the current law. Requires lenders to provide clear disclosure of the loan. I'm sorry, of the loan uh, terms and total charges. Prohibits the lender from making more than one loan at a time to a consumer preventing incentives from lenders to split loans and charge higher fees. Repeal section 480F-4 Hawaii revised statute relating to deferred deposits to provide further protection to Hawaii consumers from harmful lending practices. Effective 7122 provided that the licensing requirements established in section two should take effect 1123. Iris, you wanna uh, provide some additional explanation for the members on this measure. Yeah, so thank you so much for hearing this bill. So this is our attempt to um, try to repeal what's called, what's um, more um, frequently called payday lenders. So what we want to do is repeal that particular law and instead um, provide for what we call small dollar consumer lenders. These are um, unsecured loans um, made 
by um, lenders or consumers up to um, about $1,500 and consumers will have um, an opportunity to repay these loans um, over an installment period um, that will have generally equal um, payment amounts. Um, and I say general equal payment amounts. The last amount, as you know, if you have a, a mortgage, the last amount might be a little bit more or a little bit less than um, the rest of the payments just because of the, um, the way that the um, payments are broken out. And so we believe that this will give um, both the payday lend or the um, small dollar consumer lenders and consumers a chance to um, operate and get the funds that they need. Thank okay. you. Any questions for Iris? If not, thank you very much. Our next testifier is Richard Dan, Maui Loan, Inc., who is opposed to this measure. Mr. Dan, I see you on the Zoom call. Would you like to share your concerns about this? Um, I've submitted testimony, and I stand by my testimony. I'm opposed to the bill. Uh, the payday loan industry at present is uh, not doing well at all in the state. Legitimate payday lenders, mom and pop shops all over the state. Many of them have gone out of business. Uh, um, it's hard to do a payday loan when there are, there are very few paydays. Uh, this bill is onerous un and completely unnecessary. It also doesn't address the people who are getting loans under $600. My average payday loan is $185. And this, look, this bill won't even allow so, such a thing from my reading of it. Uh, if you have any questions, you have my testimony. I'm here to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dan. Members, any questions for Richard Dan? If not, we'll go forward to the Office of Information Practices. Uh, their, their director, Cheryl Kakazu Park, submitted uh, some information. Um, just to say that she's, uh, OIP has commented, uh, I don't believe she's on the call, uh, has commented on the confidentiality sections and versions of this bill introduced in previous years. ORP has no concerns regarding uh, the confidentiality section, which begins on page 66. So thank you, uh, Cheryl, for sharing that. We also have uh, testimony um, from the Pew Charitable Trust. Pew has, um, been very helpful to uh, the committee in years past in dealing with some of these more uh, thorny issues. I don't believe that there's anybody from Pew on uh, on the call, but I would just uh, tell the members that Pew has done a great deal of work uh, on this topic, trying to make sure that uh, consumers are protected. Um, and in their testimony, they note that the goals outlined in SB 974 align with their effective approaches from Colorado, Ohio, Virginia. Um, however, we note that one critical factor is missing in practice, provisions to ensure that all loans have a reasonable amount of time to repay. Um, let's see. Uh, they note that uh, the bill would allow lenders to offer loans with very short terms, such as $1,500 with a repayment of uh, $1,595 due back in only one month without explicitly uh, ensuring that um, borrowers have more time to repay, providing an affordability requirement. Uh, they are concerned that um, SB 974 is likely to lead to continue high levels of rebarring despite the proposal's stated intention, uh, intention. So we appreciate their comments. Uh, and they made um, recommendations that uh, uh, the proposal add a minimum loan term of four months and a maximum loan term of 24 months. Uh, as I said, they have done a lot of work in this area. Uh, that brings us to the end of the testifiers. Members, any uh, questions for Iris or anybody else that's on the call? If not, let's take a quick break and we will transition into decision making. Recess.
one. Thank you. We will call uh, the committee back to order for purposes of decision making. Uh, members, the first item on our agenda has to do with commercial property rent relief. Um, and we hope that um, this measure will ultimately uh, provide some relief, uh, focusing on some of the federal funds that we might get. The chair amendments, blanking out the dollars requested from the state general revenues, because we don't think there are any, as well as the emergency and budget reserve fund, also known as the rainy day fund. Note the dollar amount requested and emphasize that the premise of this measure is that there are federal funds available to fund the program and that federal funds would be used to reimburse any general funds that might be fronted. Uh, WAM certainly has purview on the funding aspects, um, but we're passing this along to them because CPN recognizes that many businesses are, are struggling and really these small businesses are the backbone of our economy in recovery. So that's why we're gonna advance it to Ways and Means uh, for their consideration. If federal funds are anticipated to come to the state for this purple, purpose. Um, so there are also some technical amendments for uh, purposes of clarity and consistency. So the chair would recommend that we pass this measure with amendments. Any questions or concerns from members? If not, uh, Senator Nishihara, since, we, since our vice chair is on Zoom, we'll ask you to take the roll call for us. Chair votes aye. Senate Bill 946. Aye. Senator. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> Senator uh, Miss Alucha. Aye. Senator Nishargo, aye. Senator Revere. Aye. Senator Senator. Aye. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> my, my. Senator of Health. Senator Favela. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda, thank you members, Senate Bill 903 relating to affordable housing. This measure also goes on to Ways and Means uh, jointly with uh, Judiciary. Um, I really applaud the introducer uh, for this measure, but um, there are a number of uh, concerns with the measure and I think there items that we cannot um, overcome in the short period of time we have left. So the chair is going to recommend that we defer this matter indefinitely. Um, the next item is Senate Bill 205 relating to deferred deposits. Uh, I appreciate um, the introducer for this measure. Uh, however, because I think uh, Senate Bill 974 is the more comprehensive regulatory tool, uh, we're going to defer uh, Senate Bill 205 indefinitely. Um, Senate Bill 973 relating to Hawaii Money Transmitters Act. Uh, Chair recommends that we pass this measure with technical non-substantive amendments recommended by SMA. Um, and we move this one forward uh, uh, to uh, the Committee on Judiciary. Any questions or comments? If not, Senate Bill 973, Chair votes aye. Senator Chang. Senator Chang. Aye. Senator Mrs. Uh, Mr. Lucia. Aye. Mr. Harbaugh, aye. Senator Revere. Aye. Senator San Ventura. Aye. Senator Fabella. Senator Fabella. <laughs> Can you unmute Senator Favela so we can hear your vote? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion for adopted. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. 974, I think, is our next item. Uh, this is relating to consumer protection. Um, uh, Chair introduced this for, uh, for DFI. Um, and it provides a uh, a new viable installment-based small-dollar loan transaction in addition to enhanced uh, deferred deposits. Uh, Chair recommends that we pass this measure uh, with technical amendments recommended by SMA. 
and clarify that an applicant shall not be issued a license if the applicant has a license suspended or revoked within five years past prior to requesting a license in Hawaii. Add a three-day break between payday loans requested by the same consumer. This was suggested by Maui Loan, Inc. Uh, it is, and also establish a minimum loan duration for four months and a maximum loan duration of 24 years. This was recommended by Pew Charitable T Trust when they t in their testimony. Uh, so those would be the recommendations that I would have uh, to the committee. Are there any questions or comments? If not, chair votes aye, pass with amendments. Senator Chang? Aye. Senator Mr. Lucha? Aye. The chair votes aye. Senator Revere? Aye. Senator Sampson Aye. Thank you for that one. Senator Sam Ventura. Aye. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so Thank you. <laughs> That's all right. Um, okay. Uh, that measure, just for uh, everyone's information, goes on to uh, WAM and uh, Judiciary jointly. So, members, that brings us to the end of our uh, agenda today. Um. Okay. Uh, did we have any? Did we have any from uh, from the joint we had before? We, did, we took those at the, no, same we took time. That at the same time. Okay. Just DM on that one if you want to defer to a different day. Uh, measures, uh, members. I will ask your your pleasure. We have one item uh, that's on an agenda for this morning at 10:30. Uh, we can wait five minutes or four minutes and do it today or we can uh, defer it till Friday at 10 o'clock in this conference room. What's your pleasure? We could either wait four minutes and do it or come back on yeah. Friday. Yeah. Can we wait four minutes? <laughs> Are you guys okay with waiting four minutes? This is uh, relating to uh, contracting. It requires contractors and subcontractors to submit tax clearance as a condition of this. one, obtaining building permits, I'll read slow, uh, for private developments exceeding a certain value, two, assigning a contract for private development exceeding a certain value, and three, obtaining final inspection of private developments exceeding certain value. It authorizes the Department of Taxation to require tax clearance applications be submitted electronically uh, establishes penalties and appropriates funds for a grant and aids to the county. Um, for your information, uh, I checked the title of this measure is relating to contracting. So the, I talked with the introducer and they acknowledged that it was a drafting error that the section for appropriating funds for grant and aids to the counties can't go in this measure. Um, so the recommendation uh, when we get around to voting would be to pass with amendments, taking that out. Are there texts in there as well? Allison? Okay. So um, we're, we're in public view right now, right? Pardon? Are we on we're public still view? We're yeah, still we're still live. live. Okay. Um, okay. I will, I will tell you um, that uh, on Senate Bill 2223, um, the Subcontractors Association of Hawaii, as well as the Honolulu Department of Planning and Permitting, um, uh, opposed the measure. Uh, but I think that's because um, they did not understand what the committee was trying to do with that in terms of just getting information and um, not uh, not overly burdening the system. Um, the department notes, this is the Department of Taxation, that every two years the State Contractors License Board requires contractors to renew their contractor's license and one of the requirements to renew the license is to submit a tax clearance. Uh, I think 
that one of the benefits of this measure is it will put that provision into the statute and so there will be no question about whether they need to get um, a tax clearance. Um, the department uh, says they appreciate the inclusion of the authority to mandate the electric, electronic filing of a tax clearance application. Electronic filing of tax documents significantly reduces the administrative burden of processing paper documents. So that's really the reason that um, this measure was brought up. And I'm going to take um, my Mickey Mouse says that we have two minutes to wait. The <laughs> clock up there, which is what we'll go by, says we have one minute. So I'm going to take a brief recess, and then we'll uh, reconvene in uh, one minute to act on this measure. Recess. One. Thank you. We'll call the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection to order. We had a 1030, we have a 1030 agenda, and we have reached that witching hour that had to do with uh, contracts. It was Senate Bill 22, I'm sorry, Senate Bill 223 uh, requires contractors and subcontractors to submit tax clearance as a condition of obtaining building permits. Uh, also established uh, some penalties. Uh, if, and authorizes the Department of Taxation to uh, have the tax clearances be submitted electronically, which I think is really one of the important uh, aspects of this bill. Uh, but it also appropriated funds for grants and aid to the county. The title of the measure is relating to contracting. And so that provision for grants and aids to the counties is not um, within, I checked, is not uh, within, it, it doesn't match the title of the bill. Uh, but Typically, Ways and Means does it in another faction, so I don't think they need this measure. Uh, and if we passed it out, they couldn't act on it anyway because there's a t conflict with the title. So, recommendation is that we pass this measure with amendments. We insert an effective date of 1 1 2022 for contractors and subcontractors to get their tax clearances uh, for obtaining uh, building permits. Um, we also uh, will have it. Uh, We'll have it effective for a couple of years, repeal it on 12 20, uh, 31 2026, 20, so we can have it come back and the legislature can vet what happened in the intervening two years. And um, uh, electronic uh, filing, I think, is uh, very important, and this measure codifies practice uh, that. Uh, uh, it is best practices uh, in our HRS. Any questions or comments? Yeah, 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 yeah. I just said that. Okay. Um, so, uh, members, the recommendation is to pass uh, uh, Senate Bill 223 with amendments. Um, we're going to insert effective date of. Um, one, two, I'm sorry, one, one, 2022 for uh, doing uh, their, for contractors getting their tax clearances uh, electronically. We're gonna repeal it on 12, 31, 2026. And as I noted earlier, um, the, there's a, the title of the bill is relating to contracting. Uh, section two is a GIA provision, uh, which uh, doesn't belong in this bill and will have to come out. So we'll delete that section before moving this forward for Ways and Means and JDC to consider. Any questions or comments? If not, Chair votes aye. Pass with amendments, Chair votes aye. Senator Chang? Aye. Senator Mr. Lucia? Aye. Senator Argos, aye. Senator Revere? Aye. Senator San Ventura. Aye. Senator Rivella. Senator Rivella. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Motion members. Adopted. Thank you, members. We adopted that measure and a number of other things, so we appreciate your participation, and we are adjourned. Have a great weekend. <laughs>